Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to be outlining the characteristics of living things. So we're going to start off by recapping what we mean by living, non-living and dead to help us to be able to hone in on what we mean by living things. We're going to discuss the features, these seven key characteristics that living things share, which we are you going to use the acronym Mrs. Gren. And we're going to go through each one of these line by line so that you can see um, what these characteristics are. So firstly, recapping what we mean by living, non-living and dead. That living things are made up of cells. Okay, they share these seven characteristics we're going to go into a little bit further. So things like a human being, a bacteria, um, a cow, gum tree, plants, animals, you name it. Uh, Non-living things or material objects are not made up of cells. So a plastic cup, water, sand, a cloud, they are non-living. And dead things used to be alive. They used to be made up of cells, but they now don't have the features of a living thing. So timber or a dead animal um, are not considered to be alive anymore. They're dead. So features of living things. The idea is that all living things share the same essential functions because all living things are made up of cells and all cells have certain things that they need to do um, and the certain um, substances that they need in order to survive. So the acronym that we're going to use to look at these seven key characteristics or features is Mrs. Gren. So M is for moves, R, the first R is for respires, S for senses, G for grows, R for reproduces, E for excretes, and N for nutrients. Mrs. Gren. So we're going to go through each one of these now so that you can unpack what they mean a little bit further. So moves. So we're thinking about this ability of what we call self-powered movement. That is the organism that the living thing is able to move in some way of its own accord rather than purely just being uh, blown by the wind or carried by gravity, that actually that it is able to make some movement of its own. Now, that movement doesn't necessarily have to be quick. Now, obviously, looking at some of the images I've chosen here, that three of them do make very quick movement. But plants is kind of what we're looking at here, this idea that plants will move, um, and you know, and, but the, the idea is that often the time scale that we would consider is much slower. You know, we use time-lapse photography in order to be able to see the components of a plant move over time because it's, it doesn't look like much to us, you know, in, in a normal time scale. Okay, but it's, so it's self-powered. And also, not all of the organism has to be able to move. You know, you think about a tree. It's, it's rooted to the ground. There's, there's a significant part of that tree that is never going anywhere on, on its, of its own volition, but certain other parts of the tree might be able to um, over time. Okay, so self-powered movement. Respires, that's first R in Mrs. Green. So respiration is this process of converting energy from carbohydrates and fats, these, these certain chemicals, into energy that can be used by cells. So that it allows the cell to get the energy that powers it. Okay, and it's a chemical reaction, this process. And this produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct as a result. And then the body, or the, the, the living thing needs a way to be able to get rid of that carbon dioxide. Okay, so we're thinking about in plants that um, we take in oxygen um, or, and give out oxygen, take in or give out carbon dioxide, depending on whether we're talking about respiration or photosynthesis. Respiration are the red arrows. Um, so the, it's going in and out through the leaves. There's little holes on the underside of leaves um, called stomata. Um, that then that, that's where these things go. But for us in human beings, for example, it's through our lungs. Okay, so that we breathe in oxygen that we need for respiration. We breathe out the carbon dioxide that gets made. Um, and so respiration, this ability to, to do this, this energy reaction, this chemical reaction. Senses, that is the ability for a living thing to sense changes in their environment and then respond accordingly. Okay, so we, we can think about, it. for us in human beings, there's some more of the obvious kind of five senses that you, you might think about. So smell and touch, taste, hearing and sight. There's also other senses that you have, more than just five. You have about 20 odd some different senses. Um, if you think about it, you've got the sense of pain. You've also got a sense of balance, um, a sense that you can sense heat. Um, you know, then there's other, you, you have a sense that helps you to know which way is up. Um, you know, like especially if you've been dumped by a wave in the ocean, you do have a sense of which way 
um, is, is up. You also have sensors for knowing where the parts of your body are and being able to respond. You've got sensors for internal things like hunger and thirst and, and, and so on. Okay, this idea of being able to actually take in information about the environment, see that outside or directly inside the body and then respond in some way. Grow, being able to, so growing, you know, which is kind of a bit of an intuitive sort of thing, you know, think about my children, you know, they start small and they get bigger as they get older, but growth is an irreversible change in an organism's mass. Okay, that's a bit more of a scientific way to put it. This idea that an organism's mass, that the number of particles that it has is, is irreversibly changing or growing or, you know, getting larger. Okay, and it's usually because of excess energy um, that, that goes into the body, you know, so the cells kind of get what they need to power and then excess energy can be used to build new cells and tissues, to grow them, to add more um, cells and tissues. That's why if when at a time in your life when you are growing a lot, that you eat a lot of food because you're just burning through that energy really, really quickly as your body is trying to generate new cells and tissues. Okay, um, it also happens for someone who donates blood. The idea that when you donate blood in order for your body to actually Re, um, you know, regenerate or replace those those blood cells that it uses a lot of energy. So you need to eat quite a bit of food afterwards to get your body started on that process. Okay, so G is for grows. R is for reproduces. That is a, an organism being able to make a new living thing from an existing organism that might be a single cell, like we're talking about with, with bacterium down here, you know, where it just splits into two identical cells. Um, or we could be talking about plants, we could be talking about animals or, you know, human beings. Okay, so reproduction can be in two broad categories. We talk about sexual and asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction involves two organisms and their genetic material coming together to make a brand new, genetically different living thing, like a baby. Um, or asexual reproduction, which is like what's happening in these bottom two examples, is where it's only coming from one organism making new copies of itself that are clones. Okay, so the, these two cells of the bacterium are identical, okay, to the one that was there to start with. This little runner of a strawberry plant is identical to the one that it came from. And then it establishes a new plant, and so it's genetically identical. Grass does the same thing. Okay, that, you know, the grass in a lawn is pretty much genetically identical if it all starts from the same living thing. Okay, and then excretes. So this one's a bit of a, a more unfamiliar word, but this idea of getting rid of waste products from an organism. So things that might come out of the cells that, um, that, that the body needs to get rid of. Um, it may be directly, you know, things like, so urine or dead cells, for example, are other waste um, products that need to be gotten rid of. You know, so for us, urine being processed in through the kidneys and the bladder and then leaving the body, it can also be extra water and salts in the form of sweat that comes out from our skin. Our skin is part of our ex um, excretory system. Um, and then also things like carbon dioxide and extra water that come out through what, what we breathe out is also excretion. They're waste products. Our body doesn't need them. Okay, and so that's, um, that's kind of where that comes in. Um, and then nutrients. So chemical substances that are essential for living thing to function. So they provide that source of energy or particular chemicals that allow the cell to continue to work. Now, some living things can make their own food. So plants, for example, use energy from the sun in order to generate their own food, but they do other need nutrients like water and other things, other salts and, and stuff that they come up through the roots. Um, or, for example, like animals that we eat other organisms for food. We can't generate our own, so we need to consume nutrients and energy from uh, another living thing. You know, whether that's plants, whether that's animals, or a mixture of both, or whatever. And this also in includes some water as well that we need because our cells are about 70% water. Okay, so we need nutrients. All right, so we looked at what we mean by living, non-living, and dead. Um, things and, and recapping the differences there and then looking at the seven kind of key characteristics of living things summarized by Mrs. Green. Moves, respires, senses, grows, reproduces, excretes and nutrients. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.